especially as Pentecostals, because we believe we got to have it all together at all times. We have to be happy and cheery, and everything's great, and I'm blessed, brother, and you're blessed, sister, and let's just keep on being blessed, and everything's good, and everything's fine. Yet the scriptures have so many prayers of lament. I want to begin today because I think we need to create a bit of a framework. We need to all come from the same place a little bit in our understanding. And so I want to kind of have you consider some things. I want you to think about significant relationships in your life. Okay? You got someone in mind? Now this could be your spouse. This could be a friend. This could be a sibling. This could be a parent. Just think, begin to think of significant relationship, a person that makes you feel safe, a person that you can just be with. Now, I want to put you in a living room together, okay? We're not going to get weird here, but I want, to, I want you to just consider having that individual in your living room. You're sitting together. What is the dynamic like? Now, I want you to consider your mechanic. Okay, we're now we're we're in a totally different environment, aren't we? Unless you are good friends with a mechanic, and that's the person you invite in your living room, or your spouse is a mechanic. Very different relationship, isn't it? I want you to consider maybe your doctor. Right? Unless you, <laughs> some, oh, there are people here married to doctors, so. <laughs> but, unless they're your spouse or they're a really good friend and they're the one in your living room, very different dynamic, right? When do you want to see the doctor? Never. <laughs> when do you want to see your mechanic? Never. But what happens? What is the dynamic of a relationship between you and your mechanic? It's very transactional, isn't it? Right? You, all of a sudden, have a need. You need to get your oil changed. You need to get your rad flushed. You hit a pothole going a little too fast. And they got to do some fixing of your car. And so you go to your mechanic and you have this inter- kind of transactional relationship where you give them money and they give you a service. Your doctor, same thing, right? You go to your doctor. What's that, what's that conversation like? I want you to think about your friend or your spouse. What if your relationship with them was like your relationship with your doctor? You only go and see and talk to them when things are going wrong, when you're in crisis, and please, only two issues at a time. Actually, for some of you, maybe you should institute that rule because that might, that might help you with communication along the way. Very different dynamic. But how many recognize that you need both? You need all sorts of relationship to function in this world because you can't just do it on your own. You need transactional and you need relational people in your life, right? Can, can we, are, we, are we agreed on that? Can we come today with a framework? Because I want to talk to you about prayer. And prayer is such an interesting thing because prayer in relationship with God can be transactional. But it's mostly relational. Okay, can I say that again? Prayer and your relationship with God can be transactional. In fact, the greatest transaction that we have is when we give him our sin and he gives us what? His righteousness. It's a transaction. It's a very one-sided transaction, but it's a transaction nonetheless. And so prayer can be transactional, but is mostly relational. So if you're taking notes, write that down. If you're not taking notes, it's been a while, guys. If you're not taking notes, write that down. Prayer can be transactional. 
but is primarily relational. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. We are, we are so close to finishing the series, friends. We are two Sundays, this Sunday and next Sunday, away from finishing out this series. I hope you've enjoyed the journey as much as we've enjoyed kind of studying and taking this journey as well with you. So Lord, as we open the word, would you speak to our hearts and to our minds? Would you reshape, rewire, would you wash us with the word today? That we would be different, that we would see the world different, that we would see our relationship with you in greater measure. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, friends, online, if you don't have a Bible, visit myevangel.church forward slash Bible, and we'd love to get a Bible into your hands. If you're here and you don't have a Bible, we would love to get you a little package as well. We've got a Bible and a few little goodies. And so if you're here and you don't have a Bible, see one of the ushers. You can do that now or you can see them after the service. They would love to put a Bible into your hands and just resource you that way. Okay, here we go. Chapter 6, verse 18. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Now here's the deal. We cannot fully understand this moment without kind of going backwards a little bit. Last week, Pastor Lisa led us through the armor of God. And what was the, do you remember, what was the primary thesis statement to the armor? Where was our strength found? Was it found in the armor itself? Come on, friends. Oh, my goodness. Let's go. Was it found in the armor itself? Don't be shy. It's all good. No, it wasn't found in the armor itself. The armor serves a purpose. But the power was in the mighty power of God. So if we go back to verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in, the might, in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the government. Whoa, what? No. To take your stand against the political party. No, that's not it either? Are you sure? Are you 100%? Do I need to check your Facebooks? No, what does it say? This is so purposeful. Paul is trying to make a very purposeful point here to give us clarity around where the real war is. To take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It is not against people. It's not against your neighbor. It's not against your rulers, your authorities that wear, <laughs> that, that are human. No, 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 no. The battle's not there. The battle is in the spirit against, against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is the framework. This is the arena. So what does this mean? It means our struggle is not against man. Our battle is against Satan and the spiritual forces aligned with his agenda. Now, 21st century Western world talking about Satan and demons is way off the radar of our society and our culture. Way off the radar. Maybe you're here and you're exploring faith and you're like, whoa, what? You guys believe what? But you can't believe the scriptures without understanding there's a spiritual dynamic at play. There is a devil. He is real. He has followers, fallen angels, demons, who influence what we see happening in this world. And in the hardness of humanity's hearts, 
Satan pulls the strings and sows the seeds of destruction. This is the battle. This is our enemy. So what does Paul do here? He strategically identifies both the enemy and the battlefield. The enemy is spiritual. The battlefield is spiritual. And so how do we wage war and stand for truth as a believer? It has to come from a spiritual place. And so we find it in the mighty power of God. And this is the journey, and this is the, this is the way, and this is the framework that Paul is setting up here. And then he proceeds to reveal the armor and the weapons of our warfare, right? Using metaphor. And if you haven't watched it, go back. Last week, Pastor Lisa unpacked this. But we're going to do a quick summary. He talks about the belt of truth, holding it all together. Our number one value here at Evangel, engaging biblical truth will change your life. We believe that with all of our hearts. The belt of truth, holding it all together. The chest plate of righteousness, your holy standing in Christ Jesus, your identity in many ways, who you are. Feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace, being steadfast in our conviction that Jesus is not only just the good news, but he's also the only way. And being steadfast in that, not moving on that. The shield of faith. Protection against the lie and our hope for the future. The helmet of salvation, our assurance, our new mindset given to us in Christ Jesus. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word, the Logos, the living Word that changes everything. So now what? Now we come to our moment in Ephesians 6. And here's where we take kind of the the metaphorical symbolism of the armor and we make it so, so, so practical to the battle that we are a part of. He says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Maybe your translation says to pray in the Spirit continually. Now you might ask, how do I do that? You know, you heard pray without ceasing. Who's ever ever kind of come to a place where you kind of interpret something as like an impossible task, right? When you consider, and when we think of prayer, what do we think of? Dialogue, we think of speaking, we think of bringing our requests to God, we, we think about kind of these ideas of prayer, and we go, how in the world am I supposed to live life and go to work and do the things and pray continually? Like, that seems like an impossible task. For some of you, maybe it's become a boundary from even praying at all. Because you're like, I can't do it right, I'm not going to do it at all. But we need to have a bit of a switch in the way that we understand prayer. When we understand that prayer is the mechanism we've been given for relationship with our God, we have a better understanding of how we can be people who pray continually. Let's go back to the living room for a second. I want you to be pictured just being in that living room with your spouse or a really good friend. And let me ask you this, do you feel pressure to fill the silence with someone you have intimacy with, deep friendship, deep connection? Do you feel the need to fill the silence? Can you sit in a room with an intimate person, someone that you know so, so well, and they know you inside and out, And just be silent and be comfortable. I want to convince you today that prayer is more than talking to God. 
prayer at times is acknowledging and understanding that you are continually in the presence of God as his spirit is manifest in you wherever you go. Intimacy does not demand dialogue at all times. But intimacy does demand proximity. This is an attitude or a mindset that identifies that God is with you always. This is the place of intimacy. And when you understand that God is with you always, in all situations, in all moments, it influences the way you live, doesn't it? When you, when you have a clarity around God's presence in you and through you, it influences the decisions that you make, the attitudes that you bring, the mindset, the behavior. And you begin to change, and you begin to shape, and prayer, in a lot of ways, is a place and battleground for our mind as we begin to understand God's way and his mindset and our salvation and what that means. Now, Paul says, pray in the Spirit with all kinds of prayers and requests. I I love how Paul gives us room within the complexities of life to both be relational and transactional in our prayer life. And I think at times we have overcomplicated our understanding of prayer to some degree. Again, prayer is the mechanism of relationship with God. So to pray is to have every kind of human interaction with him. The good, the bad, the ugly, the silence, the listening, the petition, the screaming at times. And so prayer is everything from acknowledging his presence to declarations of faith, to requests being made for divine intervention. But let's go back to that living room for a moment. And perhaps in the silence, you're wrestling with a need or a circumstance, and you need to unpack it. Do you hesitate? With that person of intimacy? With that spouse? With that friend? Like, do you feel awkward bringing up? your problem or your circumstance or your brokenness or the thing that you're trying to figure out, the thing that you're trying to just rationalize, like you're just trying to walk through something hard and complicated, do you hesitate? Why? Because you know that they love you and that they're for you and they want the best for you. And so it's a safe place in intimacy and in relationship to share the struggle, the pain, the complexity, the doubt, the skepticism? And here's my question. Why do we feel so comfortable bringing that to people who love us, who know us, who are there for the journey, and yet... We so often are the last to bring it to our Father who loves us, who knows us, who wants the best for our journey. And prayer demands something of us, that we become vulnerable and real. And what's so funny, because the difference between that good friend or that spouse is they don't know what you're thinking. They don't know what you're struggling with. They don't know the future of it. They don't know the outcomes. Who does? God already knows. Not only does he know what you're struggling with, he knows the outcome. He knows the end of the story for your life. In fact, if we believe Scripture, he's authoring your story. But I think in some ways this example is a little bit incomplete. Because God knows everything about you. So the dynamic of your relationship is so, so very different when it comes to God. I said that prayer in its base form is acknowledgement of his presence. But it 
must grow from there as we get comfortable with making our needs known to him. In the King James, the passage reads, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Has ever heard that word supplication? What is supplication? Let's break that down a little bit. Supplication. Supply. Special needs. You don't have what it takes. You don't have what you need. You don't. Supplication is literally the prayer for supply in all circumstances, in all areas. And so the word Paul is saying, bring all kinds, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But here are seven types of prayer that you can pray in your prayer life. Number one, adoration. This is a form of relationship, and this is relational. This is a very relational kind of prayer. Number two, and this is one that we suck at so much, especially as Pentecostals, because we believe we got to have it all together at all times. We have to be happy and cheery, and everything's great, and I'm blessed, brother, and you're blessed, sister, and let's just keep on being blessed, and everything's good, and everything's fine. Yet the scriptures have so many prayers of lament. You know what lament is? It's not going good at all. And you're ticked off and you're hurting and you're broken and you don't know what to do and you're angry at God and you're angry at people. That is what lament is. In that way, we need to stop being so darn Pentecostal and start being real about what it's like in this broken world to live out a human life because it sucks at times. How many can, can I get a witness on that? And the scriptures give us permission to go to God and say, God, this sucks. And I'm angry. And I'm frustrated. And I need you to do something about it, both in my circumstances, but also in my heart. So I don't absolutely lose it. Prayers of lament. Friends, in the Western world, we need to get better at this. And this is so relational. Because this speaks of an intimacy where you feel safe enough in the presence of God to bring your pain. Number three, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. We bring thanksgiving. Because even in the pain and the lament, when you look at the Psalms, I love the Psalms, especially around lament. There's so many, about a third of the Psalms start with moments of lamenting, and then they end with moments of thanksgiving. Because as you lament and bring your problems to God, He, by the Spirit, begins to point out all the blessing and all the faithfulness and all the goodness that is in your life. And we can begin to pray prayers of thanksgiving because he is so good and that is so relational in terms of prayer. And then number four, and this is probably the most common kind of prayer that we kind of do or know about, is petition. Petition. Where we have a need and we bring it to him. And so often, this becomes kind of the go-to prayer for most Christians. And usually, it's not an ongoing prayer. Usually, the way it works is you don't pray. You don't have a practice of intimacy with God. But then when things go wrong and things go sideways, that's when you pray, right? We've all been there. I've been there. So don't be ashamed of that. Where you realize, I've gone a week without praying, but then this thing comes up, and now I'm going to bring my petition to God. I'm bringing my need to God. I feel kind of bad because I haven't been praying, but I know that he can interview, and I really need him to. Oh, please, Jesus, come help me. Which is fine. We have permission to do this. But it's only one kind of prayer. And this is where we kind of move into a little more of a transactional moment. God, I have a need. Would you come and meet it? 
Number five, deliverance. Asking God to save us from the challenges or circumstances. Um, this is an interesting one because in a lot of ways, deliverance, in, in a biblical way, when, God, when you see God deliver the people, when you see God deliver Israel, when you see those moments in history, often he didn't just remove the circumstance, but deliverance looks like being empowered to walk through the circumstance. So don't get those two things conflated. Number six, contrition. Contrition. Moments when we come to God broken in our sin and we ask his forgiveness. Moments when we become deeply aware of just how broken we are and how much in need of forgiveness we are. And we come to him with a broken heart and we ask him to forgive us. These are prayers of contrition. Contrition, by the way, is always the precursor to revival. Contrition at scale is a precursor to revival. It always starts with repentance. And number seven, guidance. Prayers of guidance. Asking God's direction in our lives. And at its core, this idea is that he is sovereign. So sovereign means he's supreme ruler. So as you pray prayers of guidance, you're acknowledging that he is sovereign over your life. And you want him to lead and guide you in next steps. Prayers of guidance. So you can see, put the next slide up. You can see how much we see relationship up there. Prayer can be transactional, but it's primarily relational. And now Paul changes gears a little bit and he gives us instruction that leads us to the understanding that prayer is not just for us. In fact, I would argue that prayer is less for us and more for others. He says this in verse 18, With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now, now remember the context of these verses. We, we just finished exploring, you know, being strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And we're directed to put on the armor. This is, a, this is like a context of battle, spiritual warfare. And so what do relationships and intimacy and prayers for others have to do with battles against principalities? The war is for the hearts and minds of humanity. The battleground is spiritual, but the outcome, the war, is for the hearts and minds of humanity. The war is for souls, and so it's for people, both for you and for your neighbors and your loved ones. This is who the devil and his demons, and I don't mean that metaphorically, I mean that literally, is roaming around like a roaring lion seeking who he can devour. And Paul says, be alert. Why? Because when you're at war, that's not when you go on vacation, right? That's when you become alert. Because the enemy remains persistent in claiming hearts and minds for himself. Even after one comes to Christ. Like scratch that. I would say especially after one comes to Christ. At times they're at that moment at their most vulnerable. And so the enemy comes to steer them away from the truth. The Jewish people had a saying, and it went something like this. Let a man unite himself with the community in his prayers. I love that. I want you to think about the implications of that. Let a man unite himself with the community 
in his prayers. One of our values at Evangel Church is generosity makes room in your hearts for others. I would argue that prayer also makes room in your hearts for others. Prayer isn't just relational in a vertical sense. It becomes a vehicle for intimacy on the horizontal plane as well, one with another. In the last few years, I've noticed it's hard because my bubble is so very church world. And so maybe you can help me out with this. If society at large, your workplace, the kind of people you interact with. I've noticed, though, that people are feeling more and more and more disconnected relationally from people. And I think this has happened in the church as well. We feel disconnected relationally from people. Now, I think there's some extenuating circumstances. I don't think COVID helped at all (laughs) in any way, shape, or form. But what I've kind of noticed and observed is we have retreated relationally into our very small intimate groups. Some, some it's as small as just their family. They've retreated relationally just kind of into their family unit. For some, it's just like very small. And I've been really struggling with this, friends. I'm I'm not going to lie because I think this dynamics at play within our own assembly. And for the last little while, I've been struggling with this. And as I came to this passage, I just thought, man, there's something there. You feel disconnected. Begin to pray for your church. Begin to pray for your brothers and sisters. Begin to wage war on their behalf. Stand in the gap for them. Begin to pray. Because I think think God is going to do something in your heart and in your mind where you begin to adopt people. And even if you're not even talking with them yet, even if you're not quite even socializing with them yet or having proximity, there's something that God does in our hearts as we open up our heart and our spirit to others. And we begin to stand in the gap for them. You hear of a need, begin to pray for them. And I think that's a starting place, at least a starting place, where we can begin to connect one with another again in church community. The war is being waged for souls. And the reality is divided we fall. Divided we fall. But united, nothing can stand against us. Finally, Paul takes a moment to kind of reify what he's saying. He he kind of gives a living example of it. In verse 19, he says, pray also for me. Man, I love this, because Paul is like the rock star. He's the guy. He's planted so many churches. He's the apostle to the Greeks. He's like the man. And yet in humility, he writes to the church in Ephesus, pray for me also, that whenever I speak, words may be given so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Now, Paul in the moment right now, he, as he writes this, he is on the front lines of that battle. He is, um, your, your translation probably says chains. Mine says change in the NIV. That's probably not a good translation. Most likely, the word used in the Greek here speaks to a practice where the Romans would have a chain and you'd be chained to a Roman guard. So you weren't quite in a prison but you were chained to another human being that was guarding you. So this is kind of the most likely the way that we find Paul as he writes these words right here. And he's in Rome, and he's under guard, and he's chained to one of the guards. And in this moment, he says, I am an ambassador in chains. There's such a humility here. 
And he practices what he preaches. He says, I need your prayers. I'm in an impossible situation. But even in this bondage, even in this moment, I know there's an opportunity for the gospel. In fact, before he went to Rome, it was prophesied over him that he was going to be bound and that he was going to be most likely killed. So he knew what he was getting into. He knows that his time is short, and yet this is his prayer. It's not deliver me. It's not save me. It's not remove this circumstance, get me out of these chains. What's his primary prayer? That I may reveal the mysteries of the gospel. This is all that Paul is about. He is so laser focused on the mission. He's not worried about himself. He's worried about those who yet need to know that Jesus is the Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And, pr- and Paul seems to think that these prayers of others will be effective in empowering him to be faithful to the gospel. John Stott writes, It is those last words which we need specifically to notice. For quite openly translates the Greek phrase with all parisia. The word originally denoted the democratic freedom of speech enjoyed by Greek citizens. It then came to mean outspokenness, frankness, plainness of speech that conceals nothing and passes over nothing. Together with courage, confidence, boldness, fearlessness, especially in the presence of persons of high rank. And this is precisely what Paul asked the Ephesians to pray, that he may be given. Two things to note here. Church leaders have the exact same fears, doubts, struggles, and pain that you've experienced. Friends, I stand up here but by the grace of God and a calling that he placed on my life. That's it. That's the only thing. That's the only thing that qualifies me. I have the same insecurities. I deal with the same moments of depression. The same moments of second guessing and interaction and staying up at night, replaying in your head a million times, thinking maybe I could have done it different. And so Paul, he's trying to teach the church in Ephesus something here about himself. That he doesn't have what it takes. So pray for your church leaders. I know that sounds so self serving. They're vital in their ability to remain faithful and fruitful. The second thing, he prays for boldness to remain true to the gospel without deviation, which requires a working of the Holy Spirit. And that's something we can ask for every day. I don't know about you, but it is getting increasingly difficult in our society today to stand with feet shod with the readiness of the gospel unmoving on the fundamentals of the Christian faith. Things like Jesus is the only way. Things like there is a standard of righteousness and it's not dictated by us It's dictated by a holy God. And increasingly, I hope that your prayer life, as you interact in the world around us, will begin asking God for boldness. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. I was telling the worship team before service, 
that usually I have a plan to some degree for closing a service. Usually it kind of has such clarity and we're leading to a moment, we're leading to a space and a thing and, and I'm able to write it down, just give myself some direction. And all week, right up to even yesterday, I was sitting down with this thing and just praying and going, God, okay, how do we close this? And nothing, 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 nothing. And I think maybe it's because this service is not mine to close. Okay, I'm going to embrace messy for a second. I'm going to make you uncomfortable. You'll forgive me because you have to. I want you to take a moment to look at maybe five, six people around you. And if you don't have five, six around you, then maybe you can kind of move and join some people. Uh, young people, don't be scared of people a little bit older than you. They love you. And they want to pray with you. So if you're sitting, why don't you find five or six people? Maybe you don't know them. Share your name and go, how can I pray for you? And we're going to take a moment to just close this service in prayer. You're going to take a moment to close this service in prayer. Thank you.